The pyramids at Giza served as a backdrop when the Antiquities Coalition convened ministers from 10 Middle East and North African countries, the Arab League, and some of the world's leading cultural heritage experts in Cairo. With our partners from the government of Egypt, the Middle East Institute, and UNESCO, we tackled the critical problem of cultural racketeering in this time of crisis. This video series presents the best ideas from the Cairo Conference for solutions to combat looting and the trade in illicit materials and to counteract these crimes that finance terrorist activities throughout the region. Thank you, and please let me stress how honored I am to be here to um, provide whatever perspective I do have. Um, I, sh I do point out that at my level, both as a colonel in the Marine Corps and as the lead prosecutor in New York City, for antiquities trafficking. My view is at the ground level. So I, I, I can't offer um, much on policy perspectives, but I, after having been doing this for about 12 years now, I've conducted hundreds of investigations in about a dozen countries, and we've been able to recover tens of thousands of antiquities from Cambodia, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Afghanistan to Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and then Greece and Italy. Um, and one of the enduring lessons that we have learned globally is that the antiquities trafficking network is virtually identical, whether it's a Cambodian piece, an Egyptian piece, or a Greek piece. There are almost always five links in the network, and each of these separate links requires a different strategy to address it. And this is exactly what we saw um, for the years that I was in Iraq. The first link in the chain is the looter, the thief, whether it's from a published collection at a museum or whether it's from an archaeological site. The second link in the chain is the smuggler the individual or individuals whose job it is, whose livelihood it is to transport the looted items out of the conflict area and into its first stopping place. That first stopping place is always temporary and it is where the item begins to be shopped. It historically has been shopped via emails, digital photographs, and the like. Unfortunately, um, for our law enforcement and investigative purposes, they're moving away from that because that leaves a trail. And we have been able to track via email and digital photographs the transporting or the trafficking of a looted antiquity. Now they are moving to Skype, and that makes it much more difficult to track and, and identify the item. Um, after the first stop, um, the and whether it doesn't matter where it is, whether it's Singapore, Amman, Damascus, or Beirut, after the first stop, the item has to, if it's going to be sold profitably, has to surface, it has to be laundered. And the first place ordinarily that uh, looted antiquities get laundered is at the next or fourth link in the chain, and that is at the dealer level. The dealer is, an, is the first individual with international connections. The dealer is the first in, individual who has an established infrastructure both a shipping infrastructure and contacts with uh, customs officials, and also multiple locations, multiple galleries. Ordinarily, these tend to be in Geneva and then in one of the destination countries or cities, New York, London, Paris, and Tokyo. And this is where the profits are made. This is where the increase in price takes a, a dramatic leap. And this is also where the, the antiquity tends to get its first documentation. The documentation is, of course, false. But the documentation that is false is becoming more and more sophisticated. And then finally, you have the 
the resting place, the end, the, the ultimate buyer, whether that's a museum or um, a private collector or an auction house. And each of these different links requires, as I said, a different strategy. By the time the item, whatever it is, gets to the ultimate destination, it has been laundered, making it very difficult to prove that, in, certainly in the United States, that the individual had knowledge. Because in the United States, in order for me to seize an antiquity and prosecute the person in possession of it, put that person in jail, I have to prove that that person knew it was stolen. And they hide behind their benign ignorance um, and the false paperwork. So what we have done in New York specifically is shifted our attention to the dealers. The dealers are the bottleneck. The dealers are the one link in the chain that have their feet in both worlds, so to speak, in both the dark world of looted antiquities and the world of, of light, if you will, where museums and auction houses and private collectors can actually purchase these items. And shifting our focus at that end to the dealer has begun to reap uh, benefits. Uh, a few weeks ago, we we recovered in excess of 2,000 separate antiquities stolen from India, valued, <clears throat> valued at at least $150 million US. Um, most of those items did not have buyers. And that's a second thing that we are seeing. We are seeing that as we increase scrutiny on museums, as we increase scrutiny on auction houses, particularly Sotheby's and Christie's, since they're in New York, and as we increase scrutiny on collectors, the dealers are stockpiling the items. And so we are seeing hundreds and hundreds of items, in some cases thousands, in a single warehouse. What it means is trying to cut off the demand, which is the right thing to do, doesn't necessarily mean you will cut off the supply immediately. We we have not seen that in the last 12 years that I've been doing this for a living. We have not seen the, the supply cut off. Eventually it will, so you have to cut off the demand. But focusing on the dealers has proven, um, has begun to show some success. And so in that regard, um, my Egyptian brother, a fellow prosecutor yesterday, asked about contacts in the United States, so I'm here to tell you I'm the lead prosecutor for antiquities trafficking in New York City. If you have any indication, any evidence, or any belief that antiquities stolen from your country have made their way to New York, or that there is some New York connection either through a wire transfer or through shipping documentation, please contact me I'm telling everyone in this room that when it comes to New York, email, pick up the phone, my contact information will be available, and I give you my word that attention will be paid. Thank you.